And Father, we are open and receptive to what you have to say to us. And we ask that you receive all the glory and all the praise for everything that is accomplished and everything that is wrought. We thank you, Father, for it. And we're careful, Father God, to recognize you in our midst. And we thank you that you gave us the word that we are increasing in the glory in each and every one of our services and in our own individual lives as well. We thank you, Father, for it in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. God is good, isn't it? Well, you know, Wednesday night we prayed for Ukraine. For those of you that may not know, Ukraine is at war and at war against Russia. Russia has invaded Ukraine and Putin has it in his mind to get a hold of that nation. And it just amazes me that those people in Ukraine are raising up, you know, because the Russian army is, is a strong army. And we prayed for them uh, Wednesday night. And as we were praying, uh, I saw a big bear claw come across and scrape the Ukraine. And I thought, well, if I know my Bible that uh, the bear is a representation of Russia. And I thought, well, I want to check that out before I share it. So I asked him when we got home, and he said, yes, the bear is symbolic of Russia. And uh, so as I was praying the next day, Thursday morning, the Lord brought to my attention, you remember Jehoshaphat in the Old Testament? And he had rumors of those armies, not just one army, several great powerful armies were going to come and invade. And he set them to praise and worship God. And I don't know if you've seen on, on YouTube or on uh, Facebook that they are having church in those subways. And they're worshiping God. And they're believing God that, that Russia will not be successful. And I saw in the news this morning that one of the cities that Russia had occupied, the citizens of that city, and even the mayor himself was out there fighting, that they've taken back that city from the Russians. And so the Lord reminded me that it doesn't matter the size of the army, what matters is the size of God. And God is on the Ukraine side. You know, the uh, president of Ukraine, he's Jewish, and his parents, his father fought in World War II to defeat the, the uh, Germans. That, that's what they're trying to seize land. He has no reason for, for needing Ukraine. But I think he's exerting his power, and he's being motivated by the devil. Putin is a very wicked, evil man, and he doesn't have anything good planned. He wants to take those over, and really what a lot of these world rulers want to do, as we've seen in the Word, is um, they want to rule the world, and Putin has that desire. And uh, so God is working, amen? And one of the other things that I did on, on Thursday morning is the Lord, my, you know, there are different kinds of angels in heaven. There's those angels that worship God. Then there are warring angels, angels that do war. And angels have come to the aid and the defense of Israel. And many times, Israel, when uh, they were in that, uh, when they were trying to take back the, the uh, wall, uh, that the troops, you know, the enemy that is out after Israel planted bombs underground so that when they would walk across it, and they say that those mines are, are terrible, and uh, they planted them all over. And so the commander of the army didn't know what to do, and they needed to get past this place. And he told his troop, he said, well, what we're going to have to do is get down on our belly and take our knife and just poke it gently and see if we can map out an area that the troop can walk across. So they were talking about this, and all of a sudden in the desert, a wind came up and blew over there and exposed to all those mines, and they were able to walk over. What caused that? Well, I believe an angel blew on them. So I sent those warring angels to help fight with the Ukraine, and we trust that uh, they'll prevail, amen? So you continue to pray for them, and it, it astounds me in this day and age that people don't recognize what's going on over there or they don't think it matters. It does matter. You know, uh, we listen to a lady. She's concerned about her vacation, and this war is going to interfere with that. Isn't that silly? And then uh, some, some politician got up. He's hoping it doesn't interfere, interfere with climate change. 
I think this is more serious than either one of those things, amen? And we can see and know by our study that we are moving closer to those end times, amen? And so we just need to be a people of prayer, amen, and open to what God has to do. All right, we're going to continue in our series this morning on the end times and what the Bible has to say to us about that time. And we are living in a time that we are seeing many prophecies fulfilled. Jesus is coming, and he's coming very soon, and we need to be ready. You know, every time I teach this, I am mindful of the importance of getting my life together. You say, Pastor, your life's not together. No, I'm a work in progress. But there are things that I know that I need to make adjustments in. And I'm working on those things. And I would encourage you to do so too. Because when he comes, we want to be ready. Amen? We want to be prepared. And we want to be about his business and not just about our own business. Life consists more, like Tim said this morning during the office, life consists more of things. It's not the many things, because you can't take those things with you when you go to heaven. And, you know, many of us uh, have had loved ones that have moved on to heaven. And uh, I know when we were going through my mother's thing, those things meant nothing to me. Because the person that gave life and spark to them wasn't there anymore. You know, and I, I knew that my mom and I knew my dad was more than things. So life doesn't consist of your boat, your car, your home, whatever. Life consists of living for Jesus and being willing, willing to share that gospel with them. Amen? So it stirs me up. People say, well, why do you teach it? So that we can be ready. Amen? And um, when he returns. Now let's go to um, let's go to chapter 9. We finished last week chapter 7, chapter 8. I have a goal this morning to do chapter 9, chapter 10, and we'll see how far we get into chapter 11 because next Sunday we're going to have healing school. And I have a message that the Lord has laid on my heart to share with you. And uh, so uh, we want to get caught up. And so over here in the book of Revelations, let's, let's go to that ninth chapter. Now, we're not really studying the book of Revelation word for word. We're hitting high spots. You can go back and, and read it and study it for yourself. And... Um, gain a greater understanding. One of the things that I know that God wants us to know, doesn't he? He doesn't want us in the dark. He doesn't want you in the dark. He wants you in the light. He put it in here for us to know. He didn't put it in here so we don't know. We can know what's happening. We can know where we're going. And we can know things, amen, because the Bible tells us these things. So over here in chapter 9, chapter 9, in the book of Revelation, and we see that angels are, are working here. In that first verse, and it says, And the fifth angel sounded. He was sounding the trumpets. Do you remember the seven trumpets? We have to remember as we're reading through these, that these it's not listed in the order that they're happening. You know? And so we have to understand that. And we have to understand, where is he talking about? Is he talking about something that's going on here on earth? Or is he talking about something that's going on in heaven? And is it the past, is it the present, and is it the future? This is uh, the future is what he's talking about here in the ninth chapter. And the fifth angel sounded, sounded that trumpet, and a star fell from heaven into the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. So God gave to that angel, because we know he has the keys of hell and death, right? We know from Revelation chapter 1 that Jesus gained those. So he in turn gave it to these angels. So this angel can unlock hell. For what purpose? Not to empty it. See, the devil doesn't reside in hell. He doesn't live there. And for people to cast him out and say, go back to hell, that's wasted prayer. Because we know from our studies on the authority of the believer that he's here on earth. Now keep your finger there, and let's go over there. You know, people, um, they think God's in control, but he's not. There's somebody else that's in control of the world. And we see over here in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, God's not in control. 
there's somebody else in control. We see here, see here in 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, in whom the God of this world, and you notice it's a little g. So who's he talking about? He's talking about the devil. The devil is the God of this world system. He got it. He gained it through the fall. When Adam sinned, God gave to Adam authority. He gave to him the land. And Adam, in return, gave it over to Satan. And Satan now is the God of this world. So he's the one calling the shots. Now, if you go over with me to Ephesians chapter 6, Ephesians chapter 6, and Jesus came and he defeated him, but he still has a, has, has a realm of authority. But we have God's authority on the inside of us, and we can exercise that authority in this day and age. Amen? He doesn't have to run all over you. You can put him on the run. Now, over here to, um, to Ephesians, let's look. Well, let's look at the first chapter. And let's drop down, because we know this has to deal with the resurrection of Christ. One of the greatest stories, you know, outside of creation is the resurrection of Christ. And when Christ was resurrected from the dead, and he did that for a purpose, not just so he could die for us, but so he could whip the devil, put the devil under his feet. Now we are here, and we are occupying, and we have to keep him in that place, because he's a spiritual outlaw, isn't he? He's looking to get out. And we can see, you know, who, who do you think Putin is listening to? He's listening to those spirits, those demonic spirits that are up here. And they're, they're motivating and, and pushing on him to, to do these things. And so we see here in this 21st verse, it says, Far above all principality, power, might, and dominion. What are those principalities about? Those are evil spirits. Demonic spirit. Now, people say, I don't believe in that demon stuff. Well, you have to ask yourself, you know, some of these horrible crimes and some of these horrible things that happen, where do these people get these ideas to do these things? Well, they're listening to the wrong spirit. The greatest realm of influence that the devil can have is through people, manipulating them, maneuvering them. You know, he, he's one of the biggest scam callers around, isn't he? He will try to ding-dong you and get you to submit to him. But you have to, and, and I always liked what Brother Hagin said. He said, when we deal with the devil, you can't argue with him. He'll, I'll argue you. You can't reason with him because he twists and turns. I mean, you think that some people can twist and turn the truth, well, they, the devil is the master of deception. What you have to do when the devil comes into your life, you have to hold him in the arena of faith. You have to hold him in the arena of the word of God. Because that's the only realm. He's a spiritual being. You can't hit him upside the head with a baseball bat. You can't kick him in the shin. But you can keep him underfoot. Amen? And so... These spirits, when, when Lucifer, which is the devil, God didn't make the devil as he is. He's a fallen being. He was one of the archangels. We've all heard about Michael, Gabriel, and then there was Lucifer. They were three uh, archangels, and they had power from God. And Satan set himself up against God, against the will of God. So that means to me, then that, that, that uh, the angels have somewhat of a free will. And so they set themselves up against God, and God kicked them out of heaven to earth, and there he deceived Adam and caused Adam to fall. He caused ha havoc and chaos in the earth. And so he's not in hell today. He's roaming the earth. Now, who's in hell? Who's in those regions of hell? Well, people that don't know Christ. People that have not been born again. Hell was not really created for people. God didn't create hell for people. He created it for Satan and all those beings. He took a third of heaven with him when, when he was kicked out. 
And so that's what we're dealing with here, is we're dealing with these fallen spirits. They're up in the heavenlies. They're up there, you know, we talked about the three realms. When you go outside today, you look up, you see the clouds, you see the sky, but there's a realm beyond that. And that realm is occupied by these evil spirits and, and angels. They're in that realm. And then beyond that is the realm where God lives. So there are three heavens, what we see, the atmosphere, and then beyond that, and then even beyond that. And so when Adam sinned, Satan got those keys. Jesus came and he took those keys away from him. And so this angel is given the key. Now notice here, and the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star from heaven under the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. So this angel, as a result of the blowing of this trumpet, has the key to the bottomless pit. That's referring to hell. You know, there are different regions to hell. There are different territories in hell. And that's not the final judgment there. They're being held there until uh, they're judged. They don't get a second chance. They're judged, and then we'll see later on when we get into the last chapters of Revelation about the lake of fire. That's the final death. Now, people don't die there. You were created to live eternally. You're going to live eternally. You know, people think, well, when somebody dies, that's the end of them. No. The person that occupied that body is gone, but they went somewhere. And there is no in-between place between heaven and hell. There is no in-between place. Where you reside at when you die determines who's your Lord, who's your Savior. Amen? So this angel has that key, and he opens up that. Verse 2, and he opened up the bottomless pit, and there rose a smoke. Pollution. Rose a smoke out of the pit, and as the smoke of great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of this pit. So when he opens up this pit, it releases this darkness, and that darkness then covers the earth. And so we go on to read there. And there came out of the smoke locusts. Now, it's not natural no locusts. These are demonic. And there came out of the smoke. This is all happening during the tribulation time period. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power as scorpions. So they had the appearance of scorpions. And what do scorpions do? They sting. Tim's brother was stung by a scorpion on a beach once. And he said it was one of the most painful things when it stung him and then afterwards, because that stinger stays in them a long time. So these locusts have the ability. Now, the sting doesn't kill men, but men wish that they were dead because they were stung repeatedly by these locusts. And they have a time period in which uh, they can operate. And so the opening of this pit releases a great pollution. And what's in that pit, it's a wicked place. It's a holding place for the final judgment. Now, I want you to go with me to Psalm or Isaiah. You can keep your finger there in Revelations, if you can. Isaiah 24. People say, you know, there was a song, there is no heaven, there is no hell, only imagine. Well, that, that's not true. There is a heaven and there is a hell. We don't hear much about hell today, do we? Because I was told it's not political, politically correct to talk about hell. You know? But the Bible talks about it. And if the Bible talks about it, we should talk about it. Amen? All right, let's look here at Isaiah 24. This talks about hell. Hell is a very real place. And it's not party headquarters. You know, you're not, people say, well, I'm going to go to hell and have a big party. No, you're not. It's a place of torment. It's a place of great darkness. You know, people that have died and come back to like Brother Hagin, when he was a young man, uh, he was on his uh, deathbed. He had an incurable blood disease and some kind of heart issue. And he was dying. They said medical science back then couldn't do anything for him. So I think he was about 15, 16, he was on that bed, and he descended. 
he, he died. His brother was standing there, and he told his brother to go get his mom and his grandma because he was dying. He wanted to tell them goodbye. Well, they didn't make it back to the room. He died, and he descended into hell. And as he was descending down into hell, he cried out. He said, this can't be. I belong to such and such church. It's not a church that you belong to that saves you from hell, but it's a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so he descended down. And then all of a sudden, something yanked him back up, and he's back there on the bed. He, he died three different times. And each one of those times, he descended into hell. He said there was a being down there trying to grab his foot, trying to get a hold of him. And he said it, it, it smelled like sulfur. And he could hear the screams and the moans of those that were in hell. And he said that third trip down, he cried out to Jesus to please save him. And then he's put back up. Lester Summerall, when God, he, he's gone on to be with the Lord. He was very outspoken. And uh, when God called him into the ministry, he didn't want to be in the ministry. You know? He didn't want to be in the ministry. And so when he'd go preach somewhere, he would just, he would be mean because he didn't like it. And he said, well, either you get saved or you're going to hell. And then, uh, so one day he was praying, and the Lord gave him a vision. And in this vision, he saw this cliff. And he saw multitudes of people lined up. And he could hear, as, you know, as they would step off, they would descend down. He could hear the screaming. He thought, well, what are they, what's going on in there? So he went over, and he saw this abyss. He saw this bottomless pit. And he saw the multitudes of these people falling into that pit. And realize, it's, it's, it's too late. Once you're dead, it's too late. You can't switch. You've got to do it alive. You've got to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. It's not the church you belong to that makes you a Christian. You know, sometimes some of the hardest people to talk to are religious people. They think because they've been in a church or they've, they've been on some committee or, or done some kind of thing that that gets them into heaven. No, there's only one way. Jesus said, I am the way, didn't he? He didn't say, I'm one of the ways. You know, people want us to, uh, to embrace all these religions. We're all one family. No, we're not. If you don't know Jesus, you're not of the family of God, no matter what religion you're in. You know, and I often think that um, during that, after the rapture, and there are people that are left, what are these ministers going to tell their people? What's he going to tell them? So it's time now for us, if we're not born again, to be born again. So over here to Isaiah 24, Lester changed, the rest of that story, Lester changed, his, he, he had a compassion for the lost. It changed his life to see those people descending down into that darkness, descending down in that pit. You know, we need to get bold in our witness. Jesus said, I'll make you fishers of men. And sometimes it might not be convenient for you to go talk to somebody, but if you prod, you do it. You know, it, it's hard sometimes, you know, family members. I have family members that are not walking with God, and I imagine some of you have that as well. And so uh, they won't let me preach to them. They make it clear and plain. But I do get little opportunities, and I take those opportunities to plant that seed in the heart of their life. I don't want them going to hell. You know, when, both, when, when my father, I knew my father was born again, and I knew my mother was, because I talked to family members. Uh, my dad's mom, Grandma Salmon, uh, was a sweet little Methodist lady, and uh, she'd went, she lived in a little town that had two churches. One was Baptist and one was Methodist. She went to the Methodist church. And so I wanted to make sure Grandma, because Grandma was in her 90s, was born again. So I went down one time and was there talking to her, and she kept telling me she joined the church. I said, no, Grandma, I'm not asking you about if you joined the church. What I'm asking you is if you if Jesus the Lord of your life. Oh, she said, honey, she said, we had a minister come in. This is back in the days that the Methodists used to shout, the, the, the women would shout their hairpins down 
they would have a lively service. And um, oh, she said, honey, we had the most powerful speaker come in. She always called my dad Leslie. His name is Leslie. And, but she always, she always called him by the full name, not Les, but Leslie. Oh, she said, and, and my dad was the baby. And my grandma loved him. And um, oh, she said, Leslie was there with me. My dad had enlisted in the service. And they were at this meeting. And she said, uh, the minister gave the altar call to join the church. I said, no, that's still not what I'm talking about. She said, let me finish my story. I said, okay. And she said, no, we joined the church, not the Methodist church. We joined the church. We got born again, and so did your dad. So I was encouraged by that. And so when my dad turned really bad, and uh, they, they moved him into hospice, and I wanted to be there by myself. I said, I'll take the night shift. I'll sit with dad during the night. And... Uh, so I was looking forward to that, to talking to him. And, um, and I did. And, cause you know, that older generation, they're not quite sure about where they're gonna spend eternity. And so they fear death. And I knew my dad was afraid of dying. And I didn't want him to be afraid. I wanted him to be ready. And so, you know, they put him on that morphine. And so uh, he was kind of in and out of consciousness. But just because they're medicated or, or whatever doesn't mean that you can't reach them. Their spirit is still there. So I said to him, I said, Daddy, I said, I just want to make sure that everything's right with you and God. And I said, I'm going to pray for you. And I said, all you have to do is just lay there and agree. Just say to yourself, I believe this. And so I took his hand and I prayed over him. And then uh, he went home to Jesus probably about 2 o'clock that morning. And I had got to spend that time. I told him about heaven and what heaven was going to be like. I said, Grandma's there waiting for you. My dad's uh, real dad died when he was a little boy. My grandma outlived four husbands. And they said it was due to her cooking. <laughs> Not that it was bad. It was good. She cooked in fat. She cooked in all kinds of things. She didn't adhere to uh, health consciousness. And so, and each one of those men died from a massive heart attack. So I'm not saying eating that stuff is wrong either, okay? But that's what they would tease her about. But she outlived four husbands. And um, I said, you'll get to see your brothers? I said, what a welcome that's gonna be. And I said, you don't have to be afraid. I said, all you have to do is, is it, heaven is just like you open a door and you go through it. The Bible talks about the gate. We as Christians, we don't have to go through the jaws of death. You know, where people are screaming and terrified and all that kind of stuff. No, we can go through the gate. Amen? The gate to heaven. The gate of death. Amen? And so I did the same thing with my mother. Uh, when uh, she was very ill and they put her in hospice as well, um, I took the night shift again. I said, I'll, I'll stay with her the night. And uh, they hadn't started the morphine yet. So you, you could talk to her, she was awake. And so she was there and, and I told her, I, you know, and, and it is hard to talk to people when they're dying, but you have to, you have to get beyond that. And, and, I, I, and I knew my mother was born again. I had went down to take care of her sister that had stomach cancer, and she told me about leading my mom to the Lord. Uh, my aunt was a strong Baptist woman, and she filled that Baptist church up with people. That she was bold about her witness and bold about telling people about Christ, and she said she led my mother to the Lord during a very difficult time in my mother's life. She said Neola got down, that's my mother's name, Neola got down on her knees, she led her to Christ. Now they didn't continue on living for Christ for very long, but what matters is that a person is born again. And God looks at the heart. The way we get into heaven is by being born again. Not by being good, no, by being born again. Some people are just gonna make it in by the skin of their teeth. 
They're just going to make that slide in. But thank God. God doesn't want hell more populated than heaven, does he? He wants heaven more populated. And he's made it easy. He's made it easy. And we don't have to fight and all that. And so I, I told her, I said, Mom, I said, I know you're born again. I said, Aunt Evelyn told me all about your experience. And I said, I just want to make sure that things are right with you and the Lord. And my mom said, are you sure, Brenda? Are you sure I'm going to heaven? I said, well, we can pray to make sure. So I did it. And then she just slipped off. I mean, in an, she never regained consciousness. She was kind of in that dream state. Uh, but I'm assured she went to heaven. Amen. So sometimes you just have to be bold and talk to people. Talk to your loved ones. Amen. They may chase you out. Tim's grandma, or Tim had a brother that was very bold in his witness, and he's, he's talking to grandma, and uh, grandma chased him out with a broom. You know, she'd had about enough. And so you might get chased out by a broom, but don't let that deter you. You know, you might not have the opportunity to lead them, but you can plant the seed. Amen. And somebody else can come along and water and harvest it. And it's not always convenient for you. Amen. Once you lead somebody to Christ, you can't go back. Because it does something to you. To lead somebody to Christ. You know? We are here not to consume our time on ourselves. But to be busy about the Father's business. Amen? And so let's go here. Isaiah 24. Look at verse 4. It says, the earth mourneth and fadeth away. The world languish and fadeth away. The haughty people of the earth do languish. The earth is also defiled. What defiles the earth? Well, it's sin. Sin is what's defiling. It's, it's not plastic. It's not rubber. It's not straws. It's not those things. It's sin. The earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof because they have transgressed the law. What law are they talking about? They're talking about God's law. They transgress God's law. There's a penalty for transgressing God's law. They have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance. You know, people want to change what the Bible says. We have a lot of that going on today. You know, people choose different lifestyles, alternative lifestyles. And they want to do away with those scriptures in the Bible that speaks out against those things. People want to uh, change the Bible when it comes to abortion and other things. We need to stick with the word. I taught several years back. I titled my thing Hot Button Issues. There's a lot of hot button issues that can get you knocked off of Facebook and get you knocked off of YouTube if you preach these things. But we don't preach it because it's, it's convenient for people. And I think that's why so many Christians are mixed up because they're not hearing the truth. They're hearing that, well, we're under grace. We can do whatever we want. We got grace. Well, we do have grace, but grace doesn't give you the license to sin. What grace does, the true power of grace, is that it gives us the power over sin. We have the ability to say no to sin. So it goes on to say, let's go back here, and change the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant, therefore, now this is talking about uh, the time of tribulation, therefore hath the curse devoured the earth. That's what's happening. That's what's happening during this time period, the seven-year time period. The earth is devouring, the, the curse is devouring. The curse is, is taken off. The curse, when you think of the curse, think of death. And what happens when death gets a hold of something? You know, Tim likes these little oranges. And you can't buy them individually. You have to buy them in these bags. And you have to really look in these bags because they get banged around. And then they start to mold. And so I was in the kitchen one day and I thought, and you know, when citrus starts turning, it's strong, that odor. And I thought, there's something very bad in this kitchen, and I've got to find it. Well, I have a bowl of those oranges. And there was that one orange, and it, 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 it was decaying. And the decaying then was spreading to the other oranges. So I had to get that orange out 
and some of the oranges on the side because it had already infected. See, that's what sin does. Sin damages. And if we don't pluck it out, get it out, it defiles. And then it defiles others as well. You know, sometimes people sin and do things and think it's only going to affect them. No, our lives have an effect on other people. You have to think of sin as throwing a rock in the water. And what happens? There's ripples. And those ripples go out. Payday comes for everybody. So the curse. Therefore hath the curse devoured the earth. And I think this is what's happening during the time of the tribulation. Some of those events that are taking place, the earthquakes, the hail, the fire, and all those things. I think the curse is having its way. And it's vomiting up this wickedness and this vileness says the earth, and they that dwell therein are desolate. And that word desolate in the Hebrew means that they're found guilty. Therefore the inhabitants of the earth are burned, and few men left. Verse 7, the new wine mourneth, the vine languish, and all the merry hearts do sigh. So there is a, a cost to disobeying God. They transgress the law of God. And that's how the earth is defiled. See, when Adam and Eve were created, there was no death. There was no rotten stuff. There were no weeds. It was beautiful. But when Adam sinned, when he turned it over to Satan, Satan brought, he can't help but defile. Because that's what's inside him. You know, people have, have, sometimes people have wickedness inside of them. And it doesn't take long until it comes out. What's in you is what comes out of you. You know, people uh, spew out profanity. That's because what's in them. We have a family member that uses a lot of profanity. I mean, I think, man, you know, it doesn't even take a little poke, it just pops out. And, and my dad said to me, he said, I don't know why they talk like that, Brenda. It becomes a habit where they're not even aware of it. They don't even know what's coming out of their mouth and how offensive and vile that is. You know, when we first got our computer, and it was back in my office, I, and uh, I was looking up things. I was just intrigued with how you could press a button and find something, all this stuff. And so I was back there just going and, and looking through all these ministries and finding their web pages and things like that. And I don't know about now, but back then, Sometimes it would have the name of the minister. Like if I type in Kenneth Hagin, it, it would pop up. And I would go to a different, and it, it, it was a porn site. And I can remember the first one that that happened to. And the filth and the vile. I hollered at Tim because I couldn't get it off. I thought, what do I do? And there was just such a darkness that came in with that filth. Because who's behind that? Who is behind that pornographic? It's not God, it's not Jesus. You know? The devil is behind that porn. And he wants to entice men. People say, well, it's all right if they don't do it. Well, what happens is they take that in and then they want to do that stuff. And, and you know, it, and in that porn, women are degraded. We're, we're moved down to a, a slave. And that's not what God created us to be. Amen? He created us as beautiful creatures. And so if we don't get things right, we can get into trouble. So they transgress the law of God. Now drop down to verse 19. Well, look at verse, well, let's start with verse 17. It said, fear and the pit. He's talking about this abyss, this hole that's been opened up. And the snare are upon thee, O inhabitants of the earth. And it shall come to pass, he who, ha he who fleeth from the noise of the fear shall fall into the pit. And he that cometh up out of the midst of the pit shall be taken in a snare. For the windows from on high are open, and the foundations of the earth do shake. They're shaking as a result of this, this pit. The earth is utterly broken down. The earth is clean. Dissolved, the earth is moved exceedingly. The earth shall reel to and fro. It's talking about the tribulation, the time period, that seven-year time period. 
The earth is utterly broken down. The earth is clean, dissolved. The earth is moved exceedingly. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard and shall remove, be removed like a cottage and the transgression thereof shall be heavy upon it and it shall fall and not rise again. And it shall come to pass, it shall come to pass in that day, that's still talking about the tribulation, that the Lord shall punish the hosts of the high ones. Those high ones and the kings of the earth are talking about leaders, world leaders. God holds them to a higher standard. Somebody uh, went into hell and they saw these different compartments and in some of these different compartments were some of these wicked rulers. Hitler, Mussolini, you know, Peter the Great, Ivan the Terrible. They have, they, they have a spot down. They're waiting for that final judgment. So, so in that day, that day is the judgment day when God calls up the dead from hell and they're judged. They're judged for what they've done. And they shall be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit and shall be shut up in the prison and after many days shall they be visited. That word visited means judged. They're going to have, they'll be judged. They haven't gotten by with anything. So he's talking about the pit and he's talking about Tribulation. Go with me to Psalm 105. Psalm 105. So hell is very real. It's not a pretend place. It's not a place that preachers can use to scare people to do what's right. No, it's a very real place. It's a place of darkness place of torment. Psalm 105, look at verse 8. He hath remembered his covenant forever, the word which he commanded to a thousand generations. God knows what he said, and he knows what he said is right, and he knows what he says is wrong, whether you like it or not. We can't debate what the scriptures say. You know, there's that scripture that tells us not to be unequally yoked, I've had so many people argue with me about that, especially when it comes to their kids and, and, and becoming close with people that are not Christians. That's going to end up costing you. You know, if God said it, that's the end of it. Now drop down. Well, look at verse 9. Which covenant he had made with Abraham, Isaac, and confirmed the same unto Jacob for a law and to Israel for an everlasting covenant. So God has that standard, and he expects us to live up to that standard. Amen? So the pit, back to, let's go back to, well, let's go to Luke 16. There are areas beneath the earth. See, see heavenly is up here. Demonic is down here in the earth, below the earth. There were some miners. This has been many, many years ago that, that were drilling. And they, they got past the normal spot where people have drilled, and they went beyond that. And uh, those that were working there heard when they, they, they hit something. They didn't know what it was. And they could hear noise come out, out of that hole. And what they heard was people screaming. I think they tapped into this abyss. And they would not work there no more. They would not go any further. They all left and said they weren't coming back because they said it was just something creepy to hear that noise. And it, said it sounded like people moaning and screaming. So there, is, there are those regions under, under the earth. Luke chapter 16. So heaven is, uh, heaven's real and so is hell. And there, once you're in, there's no way out. You can't change your mind. Say, I don't like it here. Luke 6. Luke chapter 6. Look at verse 20.
And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed are you that weep now, and you shall laugh. Blessed are, verse 22, blessed are you when men shall hate you, and when they will separate you from the company, and shall reproach you, and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Rejoice in that day, and leap for joy. Behold, your reward is great in heaven, for in like manner did the fathers unto the prophets. So there's a, a, a reward for doing things right. There's a reward uh, for living for God, but there's also persecution. And we're coming into that time period more and more, aren't we? Christians are being persecuted for their lifestyle. They're told we can't say things. We can't do things. We can do what the Bible says we can do. Amen? Let's go to Isaiah 14. I want to show you from the scriptures. There's more to us than what we see. There's something behind this flesh, and it's a spirit. And it's created by God to live eternally, to live forever. One place or the other. There is no purgatory. There is no in-between. There's heaven, and there's hell. And you make your choice. People say, well, you know, when I get older, I'll, I'll accept Christ. I want to have some fun. Well, you want to be careful with that, you know? Because we don't know what tomorrow holds. And if you put off salvation, you might regret it. Paul said today is the day of salvation. Isaiah 14, 9. And when you die, your soul goes with you. Your spirit and soul, they're separate, but they go together. So that means that you can feel, you can see, you can smell. Isaiah 14, let's look at verse 9. Look at this. It said, hell from beneath, below the earth, is moved. And it's moved to meet you. If you're not a Christian, it stirreth up the dead for even all the chief ones. Those are presidents and world leaders of the earth. If they do not follow God and are born again, that's where they're going to spend eternity. It shall rise up from, from their thrones and all the kings of the nation. So hell is being moved. And hell is being moved during this tribulation time because it's being moved to receive all these dead people, these people that have been killed, that would not repent. And during this time of the tribulation where sin is running rampant, the gospel is being preached and people still refuse to believe. They still refuse to turn from their ways. You know, when, when we die, and, and many of you have been in the room with your loved ones, you know, and uh, someone comes and gets them. I've been in a lot of rooms where people have said that, you know, loved ones that have already died and gone over. My grandmother, her sister Mamie, she was in that, my grandma was dying, and uh, she looked up into the corner, she said, there's Mamie, and there's Jesus, goodbye, and off she went. She just fell back onto the bed, and, and her body died. And so these, these angels come to get, well, just like angels come and get God's people, the devil's crowd comes and gets theirs. When I worked in a nursing home, we worked the third shift. Now, we were told we couldn't witness. We were told we couldn't uh, preach. Well, you know, that didn't stop us. We would, you know, when these patients were dying, 
we would slip into the room, shut the door, and talk to them about eternity, that they were getting ready to leave this earth. And I remember Patsy, there was a, a lady that was right next to the nurse's station. And, and she's a very well-to-do lady, very wealthy. And, and, and she had a classiness about her, but she had um, crippling arthritis. And she was uh, progressing or Well, she was of a certain faith. Patsy went into that room, I don't know how many times, and tried to talk to her about being born again. And she finally threw her shoe at Patsy and told her to get out and not come back. That she is of such a faith and that because she is of that faith, she's going to heaven. Her priest had come and ministered to her the last rites. And um, so who was Patsy? Patsy wasn't a priest. She wasn't a minister. She was a nurse's aide in a nursing home. And um, so that night we were sitting there. And because she was close to the station, we heard her scream. I mean, it, it was the kind of scream that sends chills through you. We jumped up, ran around, and she had sat up. And the look of horror on her face was something. They had to, her jaw was open. They had to crack her jaw to get it closed. The funeral home did. And the funeral home man, when he came to get the body, he said, did something scare her right before she left? He said, she's got the look of terror on her face. Well, I think she realized, and that, that's what Patsy said. She said, the, the devil comes and, and gets his own too. And then she realized she was too late, that her religion, her, her denomination did not save her. And she slipped into eternity. She had ample opportunity, but she refused it. And so we have to be open, amen? So what I want to do before we have communion this morning, is because, you know, I know most of you are born again, but we don't know people watching on Facebook whether they've accepted Christ, and we want to give them that invitation and that opportunity to make Jesus the Lord of their life. You say, well, it costs me anything. Do I have to give up anything? No, you don't have to give up nothing. All you have to do, because the Bible said if we believe in our heart, and confess with our mouth we would be born again. So I'd like for every head to be bowed. Hallelujah. And we're going to give you an opportunity, not only here in this service, but those of you that are watching us on Facebook. If you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, if we would ask you today, do you know where you're going to spend eternity? What will be your answer? What will be your answer? Well, you can have the right answer. and You can say, yes, I know where I'm going to spend my eternity. Hallelujah. So you just pray. If you've never received Christ, you just pray this prayer with us. Hallelujah. Father, thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Father, you've said in your word that if we would believe in our heart that Jesus died for us, and not only did he die for us, but he was raised up from the dead. Father, I ask you to forgive me Forgive me of rejecting you. Forgive me of my sin. I ask you now to come into my heart, to come into my life. I open my heart to you, and I allow you to come in. I receive you as my Lord and as my Savior. You said if I would believe in my heart and confess with my mouth that I would be born again. You also said, whosoever would call upon the name of the Lord, they would be born again. I'm calling on you, Jesus. I'm calling on you now to come into my heart. I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven. And you've made it possible by receiving Christ. So I receive him now. You just go ahead and just say, Jesus, come into my heart. Just quietly there to yourself. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. When he comes in, he lifts that weight of heaviness, that weight of guilt and shame. He lifts it off of you right now. He washes you up, cleanses you, makes you pure, and put you into a right place and right position with him. 
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for receiving these people into the kingdom of God this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, it's important that you tell somebody what happened to you because the more you tell it, the more real it becomes in your life. Amen? Well, we're going to have communion now. So if the ushers would come and, and uh, give you that juice and the wafer. And if you wait for all of us to have it. And I'm going to read from the Bible God's instructions on communion. It says, Now in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not, that when you come together, it's not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there is division among you, and I partly believe it. For there must also be heresies among you, among you that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. When you come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. That's what communion is. It's the Lord's Supper. For in eating, everyone taketh before another his own supper, and one is hungry, and another is drunk. What, have you not house, your own houses to eat and drink in? Or you, do you despise the church of God and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. For I have received of the Lord that which I deliver unto you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take and eat. This is my body that has been broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. And after the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament. Often as you drink it, you do so in remembrance of me. That's what we're doing in communion. We're remembering what Jesus has done for us on the cross. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he comes. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat the bread and drink the cup of the Lord unworthily, he's talking about your attitude, shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a person examine himself, then let him eat and drink. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation or judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sick among you, for if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. When we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. And if anyone hunger, let him eat at home. And when you come together, you're not together under condemnation. The rest I will set in order. Father, we thank you for your instructions concerning communion. You said to take this time and examine our heart and examine our life. And we do that, Father to see if there's anything unpleasing to you in our life, something that we've allowed to grow, unforgiveness, bitterness, offense. If we've allowed any of that stuff in, we make a choice this morning to ask you to forgive us, not only to forgive us, but to cleanse us so that we can come freely to the communion table and partake of these elements without any fear of judgment because we've judged ourselves. So let's just take a few moments this morning and let's do that. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. We take that wafer, if you would, please, and we like for you to break that because that's symbolic of the body of Christ being broken. So if you do that, Father, we thank you that we make our way to that table this morning, that communion table, and there sits Jesus with that bread in his hand, and he breaks it for us, and he says to us, this is symbolic of my body that's been broken for you. 
so that your life can be complete, can be whole, spirit, soul, and body. As you're partaking of that bread, you're partaking of me and all that I stand for. Bread stands for life. Since we are partaking of this wafer this morning, we are partaking of life. So we bless it, we sanctify it, and we receive it into our body now in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Now, Jesus, we thank you that there is that juice. And that juice is symbolic of your blood that you shed for us. That blood that washes and cleanses us. And that blood that serves as an eternal reminder of our eternal covenant that we have with you based solely upon that blood. And because we have a covenant right and covenant privileges, we can access anything that you are, Father, and anything that you have. And ex in exchange, all that we have and all that we are, we offer to you. We offer our heart and our life to you this morning. And we receive this into our body now. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Father. Will you stand with me, please? Thank you, Jesus. Father, we thank you for the word today. We thank you for light. We thank you for truth. And may we be ever so mindful that the people that we're up against and next to, that they are eternal beings. Lead us to those that need to know Jesus. And Father, for our family members that don't know Jesus, we just send those laborers into their path to share with them the gospel. We ask for their heart to be open, their ears to be hearing, and their eyes to be seen. We claim their salvation now. And we thank you, Father, for it. In the wonderful name of Jesus, amen. You are free to go this morning.